you know, graduate certificates are not usually covered by financial aid or scholarship money. So a lot of times people pursue these opportunities, they pay out of pocket for them um, or some kind of reimbursement. So one of the benefits is that while I was working in the department of pediatric, they, it paid for my graduate certificate. So I, I pretty much like I avoided all costs um, that people would normally have to spend in order to receive something like this. So it was, it, you know, I feel like this was like, you know, like I couldn't have asked for any better way of things to be flowing, you know, for as far as like having a job, um, a job that's paying me decent money, a job that allowed to pay for my schooling, a job that allowed me to, to cut costs on all these things that I would only have to pay for it if I wasn't. Um, an employee here and able to do it. So like, you know, that role, you know, and then I was getting real life experience. So like uh, with a combination of all those things, like I feel like, you know, I was doing things like at the best time possible for me. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 51. <laughs> Hi everyone, Omari Richards. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Make sure that you subscribe, make sure that you've left a review, you've left a like, you've shared this with a friend, greatly appreciate you all. That's a way that you can share support for me, for the show, for everything that I've done, and really just help it to get to other people, get to more people, and I appreciate you all. Additionally, I am adding a link where you can all support me monetarily with buy me a coffee. Um, technically, I don't really buy coffee that much i buy my own beans once a month so it'll be more like buy me a book or something of that sense so uh definitely if you do want to support this show in any way if you've taken any value and just want to buy me a coffee or a book um there will be a link to that in the description of this as well as the show notes and uh, i'm looking forward to just continuing to reel you in and <laughs> bring you all some great um insights on uh, the podcast and with other different things that i have in the pipeline so Without further ado, here's today's show. I hope you enjoy. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Today we have a professional with almost 10 years of combined experience in higher education, administration, medicine, research, and public health. He got his bachelor's of science in kines kinesiology and exercise science at the University of Toledo, where he also got a graduate certificate in epidemiology. And then after this, he received his master's of public health. His work experiences stem from early career as a certified pharmacy technician. He currently is the Assistant Director of Student Affairs at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. We have Tyrone Leeson. Welcome to the show. Hey, hello. Hi, hi, hi. I am happy to have you on today. Thank you for taking time to join and just share your story. Um, how, how are you doing and how you've been coping during this pandemic? Um, Currently, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. Um, the pandemic was definitely uh, a pretty hard time for me and my family. Um, you know, it started last year in 2020. And at the beginning of that um, time period, that's the time period where I lost my grandmother, um, which was someone who was very close to me. Um, you know, I spent the last uh, several years, um, take, you know, taking time, taking care with her, spending time with her, um, you know, up until her very last moments. So that kind of started the beginning of my 2020 year. And then about what, uh, fast forward to March, you know, that's when COVID started. And, you know, it was it was definitely a transition. I had transitioned into a new role. Um, and, you know, we were all being, you know, homebound at that period. And then, you know, over the course of um, the 2020 year, I, I actually ended up losing about six other family members. Um, during the course of the pandemic. So uh, let's just say, you know, 2021 has been a better start for <laughs> uh, post pandemic, or you can kind of say post pandemic time. But, you know, as far as, uh, you know, like deaths in the family, and things like going, you know, it, it's been on an upswing. Uh, I've been getting used to my new role at work and, you know, going into the office on a hybrid schedule, um, you know, trying to get a little bit back, back to a sense of normalcy as far as, 
you know, maybe trying to go out and get something to eat or, you know, still, you know, keeping social distancing and things like that. And, you know, now adding another list of uh, vaccinations to my, you know, long history that, you know, wasn't there last year that I have now, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be fully vaccinated now. Um, so, you know, it, it's just been kind of getting used to, you know, a different way of normalcy, you know, going out, remembering to make sure I have a new mask, you know, making sure that, you know, I sit every, you know, a couple seats away and, you know, even at work, you know, we're still required to wear a mask unless we're like in an isolated room um, by ourselves. So, you know, it, it's, it's taking some time, but, um, you know, we're hopefully adjusting back to a, maybe a, a new norm of life. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, thank you for sharing that and condolences on all the losses. I'm really sorry to hear that. And I, I'm sorry that you have to deal with that. I know one loss is a lot and seven is is a lot. So um, yeah. like my, my heart my heart feels for you and your family. And I, like, let me know if I can support you in any, any way, like outside of this too. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. So um, to so tell me, uh, what what is your hybrid work life looking like right now? Oh, so um, it changes kind of like weekly. Um, when the pandemic first started, you know, we worked we worked remotely at home for from I think from March all the way until uh, like um, early July, and then about early in July, actually, I caught COVID. I had COVID. Um, probably about a week or so going back to work, I had. Um, caught COVID and then I was um, off for two weeks. Like I was, I was really sick. I had fever for like 104 for like 10 days straight, even with fever meds. And then um, after that, I went back to work and we were like on a hybrid schedule. So we spent about two to three days usually in the office, um, which I actually find that to be like the most desired uh, kind of like work-life balance. It's a good way to, you know, some things that it's better to do like in, like at work in the office when I have like double screens and I have a printer and things like that. But working from home has definitely been beneficial, um, especially living in Ohio for those who don't know. You know. Ohio sometimes has pretty rough winter. So, you know, I was able to spend most of that time at home completely. And then as the, you know, as the, the year started to go on and, and we started to have warmer days, we started to have more of a hybrid schedule. And, you know, that's, that's been pretty much it consistently. Um, it should be that way up until the end of May. Because as of right now, um, the president of our university has that all employees should be back on campus June 1st. Wow. Yeah, so that's going to be um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that that's really that's really quick for everyone to uh, get back on campus. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, but um, I I find it just fascinating, like the different hybrid models that have come out of the pandemic. Just how people before were saying like we can't do this and all these kinds of things, and and now it's it's changed so so dramatically, and we've seen like a new way of doing things with technology and things like that. So I think it's so interesting. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think they will take a little longer look at some of these things and we like our, um, our committee and things like that, they're trying to advocate, like maybe continue like with this um, work from home hybrid type of schedule. Um, because, uh, you know, it, it did save us money, the university money having some things completely remotely and it also, um, even from a health perspective, you know, people meeting um, you know, virtually, you saved a lot of time with like people not uh, worrying about being sick, and you know, sick times were uh, were lower this year. And, um, I mean, I was just talking to some of my coworkers. I was like, I don't think I've actually used sick time, you know, other than COVID since 2019. So, you know, stuff like that is a benefit for the institution um, to know that people are not really using, you know, sick time because of the work life balance. I feel like. You know, normally if you had a bad headache or something, you know, I probably wouldn't go to work, but, you know, being that I can like sit at home and work at the dining room table, like in the dark or, you know, with a fan blowing that that kind of like helped me be able to push through the day. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's so interesting. Uh, the sick time decrease. Um, I feel like some, there should be some sort of study on that to see what, what the pandemic has, has created around like sick time and how many people have taken that sick time and, and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I know some some data is out there saying, you know, like sick time was, you know, not really used as much and even vacation wasn't used as much, you know, so, you know, there are some benefits, I think, being able to kind of like balance between, you know, a hybrid schedule between in office and out of office, 
um, that I'm hoping that, you know, like you said, some companies will maybe look at that and maybe integrate that more because previously before COVID, you know, there were all kind of, you know, thoughts that, oh, no, there's no way you can work from home or, you know, there's no way that we can make this work. But like you said, um, even like, you know, working in a medical school, you know, we came up with very creative and interesting ways because I remember being in like my previous role, you know, like pandemic when everyone had to stay at home order, that was like right in the middle of medical students' clinical rotation. So it's kind of like, you know, how do you do, how do you develop a, a curriculum or a plan that allows students who are supposed to see patients and, you know, be in person, be able to still, you know, experience something similar that allows them to be prepared for residency. So, you know, I feel like if medical schools and, pay, and you know, other clinical um, schools or rotations can come up with ways, I feel like, you know, other, there's, there's no excuse why other people can't come up with other ways to do meetings or, you know, events. Yeah, absolutely. It's shown us that we can do things in a, in a whole different way. So um, tell me, how, how, how do you identify and tell us a little bit about your personal background? Sure. So I identify using he, him, his pronouns. Um, and I was born right, born and raised here in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I grew up um, in public schooling my entire life. You know, I'm TPS pal, Toledo, Toledo Public. Um, I went to a new high school at the time, uh, making me one of the first graduates. It's called Toledo Early College High School. And it's kind of, um, I don't know if you're familiar with early college um, high schools, but it's kind of a new phenomenon. Um, it's kind of like school, high schools there. I think there are at least three um, in Ohio, if not more by now. But um, my school was um, primarily find, funded and founded by the Melinda Gates Foundation. And it allowed us uh, as high schoolers to kind of like be dual enrolled with the university. So like I took my first college class when I was 15. And it's set up, uh, at least at the time, um, it was set up that for most graduates, when you graduate, you will have um, 60 credit hours of college done. Right. So, you know, I did that program um, from straight, you know, and from high school, you know, first graduating class, you know, that was quite, um, you know, an endeavor, you know, a little scary because, you know, my parents wanted me to continue on and go with like, you know, a, a more, you know, more, renowned school here or school you know with a track record of doing good so um you know this is kind of like my own decisions and my own goals so yeah so i was part of the first graduating class it was about 45 of us um we went on to different schools throughout um the united states most of us and i that's where um i went straight into my undergrad right after um high school actually i started that summer um, from graduating from uh, my high school. And that's when I obtained uh, my degree in kinesiology, exercise science. And um, that's kind of like where I guess life kind of paused for me. You know, I, I got a job as a farm tech and I did that for a while. And, you know, fast forward a few years and here I am now. <laughs> uh, I know we'll talk more about my career and plans like that, but. Um, I grew up, uh, like I said, still here. I'm, I grew up in a Christian family background. So, you know, I'm very much involved, like in my church community, um, very family oriented. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of uh, seven, I have six brothers. So I'm, I'm number five. So it's, it's a big family, you know, lots of, there's never a dull moment. Yeah, that's a lot of boys too. Yeah, a lot of boys. Man. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm 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 glad that you mentioned like the college courses or like getting that those college credits in high school mm -hmm. because it's it's not something that I knew too much about. I was lucky enough to take a couple of APs to to get some credits, but that is a key way for people to get into to college and like just get it cheaper, get it quicker. Yeah. There's so, so many benefits to 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 being able to do that. Um, yeah, it, it, it was very, um, it was a blessing for me because like you said, it saved a lot of money. And, you know, for some students, it gave an opportunity to graduate early. Like, I mean, yeah, I did. I have friends who were graduating at like 20. But for me, what it did for me is it allowed me to kind of like explore my options. Like I still graduate within the four years which as you know, especially for a lot of students, they're not graduating in four years anymore. But because I had kind of like that extra 
like leeway, I was able to take that time and kind of like explore and find out more things that most people would do like their freshman year in college. I was able to find that out because, you know, originally when I was um, in high school, I was planning to continue my education um, as a biology major. And um, since, you know, I had not heard anything about kinesiology before high school, you know, I took a class my senior year, I believe it was the fall semester, I took a class called Exercise and Health. And that class is what opened me up to like the kinesiology field. Because before that, I had no idea what it is. I didn't know anyone who majored in that. I didn't, I didn't know anyone personally. And, you know, once I took that course, it kind of like opened it up for me to kind of like just read more about the kinesiology department. I was like, you know, they have all these great classes that sound like more of an interest to me because I, I grew up uh, like in high school, like I wanted to actually go to medical school. That was kind of like one of my plans um, for a long time was to um, actually be an anesthesiologist. I thought, you know, I, I had to be about eighth grade when I probably thought that would be like an awesome job to actually pursue. So I took, you know, all the, you know, I graduated from high school with a science focus. And then, you know, when I matriculated into um, college, you know, I um, had found out about the kinesiology department and I kind of like changed my focus to that. So, you know, being in my high school, you know, it, it was, it allowed me to like explore options without necessarily wasting time because, you know, uh, the program is designed not exactly the same. So like if I was a biology major, like my freshman year or, or sophomore year, that probably would have added on additional, you know, at least one to two semesters, um, for me for my whole college career if I did not start that when I was in high school. So, you know, these early college programs are, are a great tool. I think not only to save money, but it can also be a way to help you be able to figure out what you wanna do. And plus, since I chose to stay at the university that um, my high school was connected to, which is University of Toledo, it also saved me like the process of like having to go through like a lot of the application process that um, a lot of people usually have to do when they're applying for schools. Like I didn't have to like do any kind of like entry test or I didn't have to pay any kind of like fees, like the university had waived all of that since we, I was already a student there and I, and I was matriculated into, um, you know, their programs. So I did not have to um, do the whole process um, to get into a college. So that saved money and time. I just was, it's like I graduated and then it was like, I was able to enroll in a course like the next day, like, you know, for the summer session. Yeah, that's awesome. And it also saves stress, also saves stress. Lots of stress, <laughs> lots of stress. Yeah, I could you imagine. So, so what, when did you say you got experience with that kinesiology exercise science class? Was that in high school? Yes, I was, I was a senior in high school. Okay, so yeah, so tell me about the, the thought process of, of choosing to, to get your bachelor's of science in kinesiology and, and exercise science. Okay, so my original plan, like I said, I, I thought I was going to medical school or something clinical. So I thought biology would be the, route, the right the route to go to because, you know, when you research a lot of these things, you know, I think biology was listed as like the top major. And, you know, I, I had an interest in science, um, more biology than chemistry. But, you know, I thought that would be a good route. But when I found the exercise and science department, um, you know, when I compared the courses and stuff to the biology courses, to me, it just made more sense that that would be something that I would probably um, would want to do or focus in because it had a lot more courses that were geared towards what I felt like to be more clinical. So part of the, you know, the kinesiology department, you know, we took classes like human anatomy, we took classes like physiology and biomechanics, you know, I took an EKG class so I can interpret you know, EKGs and first aid, whereas if you took biology, you know, you took things like parasitology or, you know, plant physiology or, you know, it was biochemistry. So it was courses that I feel like were applicable as far as science went, but not as direct care. Like, you know, like those are all great, those are all great courses to take, but I'm like, you know, if you see a patient here or someone here, like, can you even do CPR on them? You know, like that wasn't ever, yeah, like that wasn't a requirement for the biology department. So for what I felt like, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare. I thought that was a, a pretty good route to, you know, go for. Plus I knew that there were other alternatives that you could do with exercise science, um, like outside, if I didn't like apply for, you know, medical school or anything like that, you know, there were other initiatives that, that would at least prepare me 
for something that was like health care driven versus just like only solely like being in the lab like some people do when they get chemistry or biology like you can usually only work in a lab or maybe teach maybe at some like private schools but um, I feel like kinesiology just had a more versatile type of approach than biology did. Yeah, and hearing you say that and hearing me reflect as a biology major, I'm like, yes, that, that makes a hundred, a hundred percent. Like I, I agree with that a hundred percent because biology, you learn nothing about like actually taking care of people or anything like that. You're learning about cellular parasitology, immunology, yeah. all these things that are kind of like really small level. Uh, the only thing that I would say that I really took away from like my biology coursework is just like how to study, how to research and things like that for, for my master's of public health. But that is that is key insights because it's it's so, that's so weird that as an undergrad student, a kinesiologist, uh, a bachelor's gets more clinical experience than a, a biology student. But I just, I feel like that just speaks to how the the pathway for medical students in the U.S. is kind of like fraud in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, sometimes it's driven by like the university or, or the department on how they're they're driven, um, you know, because like, you know, like for example, like my university is one of the few universities that actually offers like cadavers like on the main campus for the undergraduate, um, undergraduate majors. You know, most times uh, the cadavers are only reserved for like, physical therapy or PA or medical. So, you know, the graduate students, but, you know, we're um, lucky enough to have um, cadavers on our main campus where usually like all of the um, exercise science students, the nursing students, um, I think also the speech language pathology students, like they all have the ability to utilize, uh, you know, get used to cadavers. So like, that's a unique feature to um, our institution and, um, you know, it's, it, it definitely, I feel like help kind of like make me, um, focus more on choosing that as a major. Okay. And that makes sense. And I forgot to ask you, what does mm -hmm. public health mean to you? <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, you know, public health means a lot of things to me. So, you know, when I, um, think about it, you know, I think like the CDC, um, has actually a pretty good definition of it that I kind of like just kind of like expound off of. So I, I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll um, read that actually for you. So the CDC's definition for public health is that it's the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities and individuals. And for me, like, I think that's a, a pretty, you know, good definition of public health, but like, I like to take that just a little bit further. And I wanted to like point out the importance um, of two key words in that whole definition. And it's the science and it's the art. So for me, you know, when I think about the science of public health, you know, I think that's when people think about like the biostats or the epi or data analytics. And then, you know, the art side of it, you know, I think of like, like soft skills. So things like being adaptable, communication, critical thinking creativity and for me you, you got to have both of those things in order to kind of like see public health through the right kind of lens because you need you it's, it's very hard to solve any one of those issues with just looking at it through one of those and you know i feel like a lot of times um most people are, are one or the other so to me what makes like a really great um public health expert or a, a good public health practitioner is when they're able to combine both of those things. So to me, public health is a it's an art and a science. Okay, I, I like I like that a lot. I, I don't think I've, I've ever heard someone like emphasize that as much and and talk about make being a, a successful public health practitioner needing both of the arts and the science. But I definitely agree with that because it's not it it's it's an interesting place in like the science social science realm yeah. of, of work um so there, there's definitely both of those components in there so that, thank you for highlighting that um, yeah because you know and I, and I think that with um especially with public health you know sometimes people don't know how to even group public health is public health science or is public health like a social science and you know i feel like well you know 
that just kind of like it's it's perspective kind of like on what you do or how you contribute to public health you know like i said you know like when people think of like different concentrations and things they think well you know the more you know nerd or data data driven people tend to be like the biostats people or the epi and the people who are more social driven or more you know community involved tend to be like the health education um type of concentration or policy and you know i feel like you know each of those concentrations are um divided separately but you know like when you talk about a health department or when you talk about like a, a academic department like they're made up of all of that you know because there no one solely works on a project by themselves so you know, having, you know, if you're someone who has more than one of these skills, which, you know, that was kind of like my idea for what I did for education, for master's when I chose a graduate certificate and when I chose a public um, health concentration was that I was trying to make myself as diverse as possible. Yeah, I, I like I like that thought process there. Um, were there any other takeaways that you had during your bachelor's program that you wanted to share? Um, probably just, so my bachelor's program, um, I think it's a pretty big program, you know, at, at my university. You know, some universities um, don't have a kinesiology exercise department. Um, you know, I remember like just trying to like research and just see like, I mean, like like as far as HBCUs, like I think there's only like two or three. So like it's a program that isn't like everywhere, but um, for us um, at UT, you know, it, it, I just want to let people know that like, or what I got from exercise science is that it's a very diverse area. Like I have friends who went into this field and, you know, some of them are physicians, some of them are PAs, some of them actually do research in different areas of exercise science, like biomechanics or exercise physiology. Like I have a friend who's doing, you know, like the effects of like um, temperature on the immune system and then like exercising in that, like, you know, like it's, it gets, it's a very diverse, um, major that can take you, you know, in multiple directions. So um, that was kind of like one thing that I took from kinesiology. And that's why, you know, whether or not I actually, like I actually directly use that information, I know that it was something that can prepare you for a lot of different things. And that's what I feel like it did with me um, and my journey into public health. Yeah, and I think going back to your, your point earlier about um, you choosing between biology and kinesiology and seeing that you can actually do a lot of different things with kinesiology as opposed to biology. You're either probably going to med school doing research in the lab for the most most parts um, or teaching. Um, so yeah, yeah. so yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that. And uh, that that is, is definitely something to, for people to think about when, when they are going through their processes. Mm -hmm. So. After you graduated, you became a research assistant at uh, Toledo University. Or is it the University of Toledo? It's the it? University of Toledo okay. Rockets. We Rockets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how how do you come across this position? So actually, um, I came across that position while I was a senior um, in my undergrad. So I I, I got that position. Um, actually, it was a work study position. You know, it was a work study position it was for the Department of Neurosciences. And, you know, I was looking for a way to like, you know, gain some more science experience and, and you know, getting paid is always, you know, a wonderful, you know, thing to do or get. So, you know, I applied um, for the position um, on neuroscience on the health science campus, you know, which for us, so University of Toledo, it, it was, you know, back then, it's a little small now because of COVID, but like um, University of Toledo is typically about like a 23, 25,000 um, student um, campus. And, you know, so like we actually have like, we have a couple of different campuses. So we have the main campus, but then we have the health science campus, which is connected to a hospital. And then there's also a couple of colleges that are like pharmacy, college of medicine, physician assistant, and some of the biomedical science and PhD programs. But, um, you know, so I applied for this job over there, you know, thinking this would give me more exposure um, to the health science campus. So, you know, I was a little nervous, you know, I've never been over there. I had no courses over there. And, you know, I, I went and I applied and I had an interview um, with a lady um, named Dr. Martha Howard. And, you know, I, I was a little intimidated. I remember like my mom having prayer with me and stuff before in my interview. And, you know, I was nervous because, you know, I see all these other people lined up and, you know, I seen, 
like we had like a general kind of like a, a sheet when she wanted us to just put our information on there. So people will put like, you know, their name, they'll put like their major. So I remember like, you know, going against like chemistry majors and biology majors. There was an engineer major and there was even a, a, a MPH um, student on their list. Something like, she's probably not gonna choose me for this exercise. I mean, for this neuroscience um, research assistant job. But, you know, I remember, you know, I went in there, I interviewed with her, you know, we talked for, I think, probably almost an hour. And, you know, she let me know that she had it. She had, um, I think, two or three more students after me that she would probably know by the end of the week. And then the next day, um, you know, she had called and told me that she wanted to offer me the job. So, you know, it was like, it was like, you know, she called me on like Wednesday and told me that she wanted me to come in on like Monday to start so I was like I was I was very geeked I was excited and you know I, I came in and you know I seen that she had also hired um, the NPH student mm -hmm. and you know I, but she had hired the NPH student to be like the glass cleaner like all they all they was going to do was clean all the glassware all of the test tubes all of the you know dishes and things like that so you know I, I had to ask um, her you know of all these students you know all of these you know, biology and chemistry and even graduate students, like, you know, like, what made you choose me? And I remember, her, you know, she was like, you know, Tyrone, she was like, you were the only person that indicated that you wanted to learn something from this experience mm -hmm. and not just something to put on your uh, resume as a way to get into like a grad school or get into medical school or, you know, nursing school, you know, people like you actually wanted to learn something. And so, you know, that was one of the moments in my life where, you know, it was kind of like a, a very humbling experience because, you know, I was nervous, you know, I'm talking, like I'm literally talking to a neuroscientist, you know, I feel like, you know, like these are people that you think like, you know, they are so like out of touch and, you know, but, you know, like Dr. Howard was not, you know, so, you know, she gave me the opportunity um to work with her and um you know to this day like we have great conversations you know she asked me you know what's going on you know I asked her about her and her family and like so we, we we established a great bond and you know I ended up um working in that position for the for the whole entire senior year okay that that is awesome and that is some great information just there like in that interview yeah everyone was coming in asking for things to help them get along their path and not not really truly investing in okay this is something that I can learn all these different things from and just learn from it and um that that's great that you express that even though you're nervous and you're able to to get the position that's uh, yeah. that's, that's awesome well I, you know I, I've always considered like I'm a natural learner like I've, I always want to learn things and you know I consider it to be one of my greatest assets and you know, so far, you know, like that was just another testimony of like, you know, like my eager, my eagerness to want to learn um, actually got me a position. And, you know, it, it was something that I continue to have, you know, I continue to have to this day. And, you know, I feel like it, it, it always is, it, I get more good out of it than bad. Of course, sometimes it may annoy some people because, you know, I, I always have questions and I'm like, well, how does, how do you do this? Or how does that work? Or how does that make sense? And, you know, some people, don't like to be questioned. So, you know, it's one of those things that um, it's, it's kind of like good and bad, but it's something that I, I own, I know it's me. So, you know, I never not ask questions or never not try to learn something. So, you know, it's part of Tyrone. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think the right people see that in you, and and they probably see that as a as a good attribute. Um, if if people don't see it, I feel like you shouldn't even worry about those kind of people that that, that yeah. don't don't want you to yeah. leave, don't well, want I, questions. Yeah, and it comes up more so than than more so than what you probably expect. Because I remember like talking to one of my mentors recently about something, and you know, I was saying like I just don't know why like like why people want to settle for just like mediocre like why do you only like why do you only want to do this much work and she was like you know Tyrone she said everyone's not going to be go-getters like us and you know it was something simple but you know it was a point that it kind of like hit home because I like I understood yeah she's she's you know my, my mentor was right like you can't make everyone have that drive that you have to do something or to be great or to continue to not just be complacent so 
you know, that was another kind of like um, lesson that I've had to learn um, about myself and about others. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And co comfort is a drug, you know, like it's, it's really, really easy to just get comfortable and complacent and not want to get or see more in, in your life and things. So, so that, that's great that you have that growth mindset as well. Yeah. So what, what, what did you do in this role? So um, for me, so, so, okay, I mentioned, so my undergrad is exercise science, but we have different concentrations in exercise science. Like you can be exercise science, you can be nutrition, or you can be biomechanics, or you can be exercise physiology. So my background was actually in exercise physiology, specifically under exercise science. So like I already had like a pretty good basis of like chemistry and biology and physics and things like that, but I don't necessarily go, I didn't necessarily have that additional background like maybe as a biology major like I didn't have to take biochemistry like one and two or analytical or physical chemistry or, you're, you're know. lucky you're lucky <laughs> yeah so you know I feel like which but, but in this particular case I feel like having some of those types of feedback or uh, some of those types of classes would have been able to prepare you for some of the work that I had to do that I had not um, experienced or knew about before so actually I feel like my mentor uh, my boss at the time was um, also she kind of like understood that so like I did a lot of like how do you call it? kind of like back work to kind of like catch up like quite quick quack quick crash course like mm -hmm. alliterations mm -hmm. yes and in certain areas of like you know protein chemistry and you know and physical chemistry in order to do some of the types of experiments and things that I had so you know I feel like that's, that's a good sign of always a good boss or a good manner is that they kind of like meet you where you're at. She didn't give me things that she knew that I could not possibly do. But like, you know, in the process of, you know, of working on it over nine months, you know, like I learned how to run like, you know, different um, electrophoresis gels. Um, I helped her with some of the ammo dissections with mice and things like that. I helped her with cryostatting, um, how to do, um, how to run PCRs. Um, and then also kind of like uh, background information on some of the things. So like I said, she's a neuroscientist. So I learned a lot about like, you know, like the neuro system um, in general. And like for her, she's specifically like an expert, like a world without expert in the enteric system. So, you know, she focused a lot on like serotonin levels. So that's why I learned a lot about like the GI and about um, like gut bacteria and things like that. So I, I learned a lot. It was a kind of like a like a massive crash course of different things, but, you know, um, and then she was very anal about making sure I, I understood how to um, keep a good lab book, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which was a skill that, you know, I thought was kind of like excessive at the time, but I realized how, you know, beneficial and useful um, the skills that I learned about, like how to cook, how to keep good notes um, and, you know, how to short, um, short write different types of you know things um that's a skill set that you know she taught me uh day in and out on how to do <laughs> so you know it, it was a very good experience a very good um kind of like um like an eye opener for like research and stuff you know like i seen her most of the time i would see her like it was almost like a um how do you put it? It was almost like a, a reward when I get to spend time with her in the lab because that was my first time realizing how much researchers have to spend so much time with like writing grants. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of her work and things are grant funded. So she probably spent, uh, to, at least to me, it seemed like she probably spent like 90% of her time on a computer. <laughs> And when she got into the lab, which she said that's what she really enjoyed, you know, I can tell that that was like her happy place. And, you know, she was happy and she was happy to show me different things and, and teach me a whole bunch of different, you know, um, systems. And, um, you know, it, it was kind of like an eye opener for me because I was like, OK, if I ever consider research, I, I know that I must be extremely confident in my writing skills because that's what she was doing the majority of the time, which before that period, I had never thought about. <laughs> okay, okay, that's awesome. And you give me flashbacks of undergrad here with all that uh, chemistry and biology stuff you're talking about. <laughs> like, yeah, and, you know, it's kind of like a crash course. Like, tell her, I want you to read this, 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 this. And, you know, she'll tell me, she'll be like, now tell me what you learned. And she'll ask me questions. If I wasn't, she'll like, go back and, and read again. Like, she was kind of hardcore. Like, she really <laughs> was. But, you know, I felt like she's just preparing me for like, 
like the real world. You know, I feel like a lot of people, you know, students included, you graduate, you don't really have a, a good indication of what real life work is like. And, you know, I see it a lot more uh, with medical students too, because, you know, they've been students like their entire life. So some of them do summer jobs and it's like, you know, some of them are really, you know, not experienced. Like they've never filled out like a W-2 form. They never filed taxes. They, so it's just little things like that, that I think some people take for granted. And, you know, I was able to like get exposed to that, you know, as a 19 year old, 21 year old, you know, um, trying to, you know, be a professional. Yeah, absolutely and, and i think there's a there's a point there like you apply for this job not having all the skill sets there but you had the veracity to want to learn and they saw that and i, I think a lot of people know that students are very coachable teachable and they could learn mm -hmm. these things and do it so just showing them that you're willing to learn i think is a, is a huge uh, part of it exactly and and you know because like i said i felt like she was going like why would she not accept you know the, the the master's chemistry student for this type of role like they've probably done this countless of times and it's like okay i have to learn what the point of even running a jail is you know <laughs> let alone learn how to do it so you know but she had the patience and like you said i had to drive like you know i would take stuff home i would read i would watch youtube videos like oh so this is what's happening you know these you know this ptr this is what's happening with you know what inside you know the, the cryostat or inside the centrifuge like you know so, so yeah having that drive there definitely made a difference on you know like you know I feel like her taking the faith on me was giving me the job but my skill set and my drive is what kept me employed there for nine months <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't have to keep me there you know past the semester but she didn't want me to but you know she kept me the summers fall and spring Okay, that's, that's awesome. And then after this role, you were an inpatient pharmacy technician at the University of Toledo Medical Center. So how do you come across this one? So there's a little in-between phase in there. So one, so actually, so when I was working in the lab in my senior year, I, I thought like, you know, like this is a great opportunity, but I'm going to need a way to make more money. <laughs> Just in the process of the time. So I ended up like Googling, I remember I was Googling, I was looking up like, you know, different jobs and things that you can do where you can make more money without necessarily have to like go to school for it. like, because I'm like, I'm already a student. So I was like, you know, it's not like I can, you know, apply for, I mean, I could like apply for a different school, but in the program, but I'm not trying to be enrolled into the program. So I ended up doing some research and I ended up stumbling across um, a pharmacy technician. So, you know, I started to read and I was like, oh, wow, this is something that you don't even have to technically like go to school for. There is a certified test that you have to take where most people, unless you went to some kind of program, you wouldn't be able to pass. But because of my extensive, you know, background with like chemistry and biology and stuff, you know, I pretty much just had to focus on learning like the law and learning like about like the, the different drugs, but like the physiology I already knew, the biology I already knew, chemistry was easy to figure out how to do like the math when it comes to different, you know, mathematical um, situations that you do need to learn. So I bought like a book on Amazon. I bought some, uh, I mean, I watched some like YouTube videos again and I found some different um, like resources on the internet and like over Christmas break, I like crammed everything. I scheduled my test, which I think was a $125 test. And, you know, I took it, I think like December like 30th or something, December 31st. and you know, they told me that I passed. So after that, you know, I tried to immediately find like a job, you know, I had a couple of interviews and I wasn't getting in anywhere. So I, I finally like fast forward to like May, May, you know, I was getting ready to graduate. I ended up getting a job at a place called Omnicare. Um, Omnicare is a big kind of like long-term care pharmacy where I, um, you know, I got good experience there. I ended up working specifically in what they call it, like the cage, which is uh, an area that is specifically restricted because it, it's where all the narcotics and controlled substances are. So I, I work with narcotics and controlled substances for, you know, six months for like 60 hours a week. It was a lot of work. It was, but it was like, it was great. I learned a lot. But then, you know, I told me, you know, like I'm working a lot of hours, you know, for an, you know, more money than I was making before, but not necessarily a lot. Like I'm trying to find something different. And anyone who knows who, who works in like a pharmacy technician, the usually the more money comes from like either specialty or hospital. So, you know, I applied um, 
to a job um, at, at the University of Toledo Medical Center, we call UTMC for short. I had applied for the job because the job had come on, on the job board while I was still working as a research assistant. So I had applied for that job um, in like May or so. And I didn't realize at that point that, that job was considered an internal job, which, which means that's only you have to be an employee of the university to actually apply. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I got like I had an interview and everything. And then, you know, they love my experience that I've gotten, you know, at um at Omnicare. And I, you know, like I interviewed well. They said, you know, my clients, I had a good experience at least with narcotics, which is probably more than some of the other people who interview. And just to find out that they told me I wasn't eligible for the position because I was a I was not an actual internal applicant that could actually be interviewed because I was technically like a work study student. So make a long story short, you know, I um, they ended up, you know, making the position external. And I, they were then able to offer me the job. So, you know, I the job at that time was um, it was a part-time job, it was nights. Um, it was technically um, two nights a week. It was kind of like two nights on week, and then and then the next week will be my weekend to work. So I was like, great, because you know the, the money there. I mean, they were paying me like like six dollars or you know like six dollars an hour more than what I was making um, at the retail at the long term care facility. So I was like, no, this is perfect because you know I have the ability to kind of like have work life balance. And, you know, if you know anything about the hospital, there's always like open hours. So, you know, I trained for about forty hours a week for uh, I think four months, and after that, I dropped down to just like um, two days a week. But then I was always able to pick up hours, and that's what I did. I got picked up all shifts. I was trained in all shifts. You know, first, second, and third. And I would just pick up hours. And then about two years after that, they had um, a a full-time position had opened. And I had ended up taking that role. Um, I was full-time nights. And then I got a full-time days position eventually. So like, it was a great place because, you know, working here was like my first real experience into working in, in a clinical environment. You know, I was able to work with, like, talk to doctors, talk to nurses, talk to residents, you know, kind of like learning, like, the structure of a hospital, you know. Um, So, like, I I went to work almost 11 every day of going to work. Like, it was, it was like, it was like, I I keep saying nerd, like, I kind of call myself a nerd, but it was kind of like a nerd overload. Like, I can go in and, I mean, literally, there's something to learn every day. And like, I would literally, you know, ask the pharmacist all kind of questions like, you know, how does this work? You know, how can you fix this? Or isn't this too much? And as a pharma tech, you know, you, you really are kind of like the first eyes of everything. You know, I can see something like this is anti- like, isn't this kind of a high dose? And, you know, the pharmacist will, you know, look over it or they will, you know, look into what the issue is. And they're like, oh, well, no, okay. That's not high for this person because they're actually, you know, they're on a methadone treatment. So like, okay, that's not high for them because you know, they're taking higher doses to battle, you know, their opioid addiction. So just things like that, you learn um, just by doing it. And, you know, again, that's the difference between like, I feel like I'm just a farm tech and versus someone like me, because there are plenty of farm techs who work and they don't really know anything because they're like, that's not their job. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're paid to do. They don't really care. But, you know, for me, I I made it a point to like, I'm going to learn all these drugs that I work with day in and out like i'm going to know what this is for i'm going to know if this is a high dose or a low dose you know and i made it kind of like my own mission you know being someone that was already interested in like healthcare and science to make sure that i did so you know i learned how to how to do like chemo um i learned how to do like how to create different iv solutions uh i learned how to do like sterile compounding and you know more or less kind of like i learned like the medical jargon that 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 doctors use um as well as different diagnoses, because you know every single time a patient is admitted in the hospital, you know you can see like everything, you know what they're there for, their history, you know what medications they're on, what they were on. So like it's like a like an all encompassing view of like a of a person's like history when they come in. Like this is part like this is part of your job, you know. So I found that to be very um, fulfilling and never dull. 
And also um, for me, you know, it was an opportunity that, you know, at this point I had been out of school now for like a year. I guess, you know, my, my plan was just working like a year and figure out what I want to do. Like do I apply to medical school? Do I apply to a grad school or something else? And at this point it's like, oh, I like this. Like, do I even want to apply to pharmacy school now? You know, like it was a very, you know, um, kind of like a window for me to kind of like explore um, different opportunities. And also being a full-time employee at a university, they pay for schooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I just, I had the opportunity there. I just needed to kind of like pinpoint what it is exactly I wanted to do with all of this information and all of, you know, my past work experience and degree. Yeah, and, and that's awesome. And I feel like that's another key tip there, being an employee of a university usually gets you a very, very good discounts on, on the courses that you take there. It do, and, and University of Toledo is one of the few places that I know that, you know, um, up until actually, I think this year, like you receive the benefit like on day one, like you could be, you could start like right here and if you enrolled in a, if, if, if a new semester started like in two days, you would be eligible for free tuition. And like, we don't do, like, there's no commitment. So like a lot of people come, they work and then they, they go somewhere else if they want, you know, because they're not committed to having to, you know, return any time here to the university after paying um, for their schooling. And, you know, one other point I want to point out about is like, so we had tuition assistance, which is different than tuition reimbursement. And a lot of people don't always know the difference, but like that, like I tell you, that just means like, I didn't have to put any money up front. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people have to pay up front and then they get reimbursed and it's conditional on, you know, if you pass and you must have a, you know, grade higher than a B and, and et cetera. And like, you know, we didn't have those um, stipulations um, at my institution. That sounds like an awesome institution to, to work at, to get your MPH out or just get uh, some yeah. additional training. And, yeah, you can go for anything too. Like, I mean, there are a couple of exceptions for some of the professional programs, like obviously like medical school or pharmacy school, but like, you know, being in healthcare, working in hospital, like if I want to go back and get a master's in like art, like they pay for it. It, it isn't even like specific to, you know, some places have that clause that you must have something that's going to like, bring value to your role or to the company that you work in but like at our university there's no um stipulations or guidelines for what you can choose for your master's or or even phd phds covers that as well okay that's that's uh that's pretty awesome um thanks for sharing that and yeah. so so uh okay so you after this you were instructed mm -hmm. ross education llc and, and then after that, you were clerkship and curriculum coordinator for the Department of Pediatrics. I wanted to, yeah. I, I just wanted to state that to ask you where in this process did going to your master's of public health come, come about? So it kind of all happened very quickly. Like, so I had ended up working at the, at the hospital, you know, pretty much in different settings for like four years or yeah, about four years or so. And then what happened is I, so I ended up doing days, like I ended up doing days and then I got a job teaching at Ross, like in August, which was, um, Ross was pretty much like a, a five to nine deal Monday through Thursday. And I worked daytime at the hospital from six to two 30. So I had really long days, um, but I had every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday usually off and then it would vary because when it was my weekend of work in the hospital, then I got a day off throughout the week. So it was kind of like, you know, I, some days were long and some days weren't that bad. But you know, it's like, you know, I'm a young, you know, 24 year old, like, like I can do this, I can do this. Well, a position came open at the university um, for uh, the clerkship and curriculum coordinator for the Department of Pediatrics. So that position, um, it opened up and it was kind of general, you know, they wanted someone who had like clinical experience. They wanted someone who had at least a bachelor's degree. And it was a, uh, I think it was an 8.30 to four job. So I'm like, um, well, you know, anyone who knows like as a farm tech, there isn't really much room to grow. 
necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like unless you're a pharmacist, there isn't anything else to really like grow. And I mean, there are kind of like lateral moves or a couple of positions in the pharmacy world where you can make maybe a little bit more money, but nothing really like drastic for what I was looking for. So I looked at it like the correction curriculum coordinator um, position in, in pediatrics, you know, it actually had quite a few benefits. One, uh, it was an opportunity for me to make more money. Uh, it had a higher pay scale than any of the pharmacy technician jobs had um, at the hospital. And then two, which was, for me, like the greatest benefit is that I have the opportunity to get like an inside look at medical school. And, you know, so I took this position, um, you know, they offered me the job. So now it's like, okay, so I quit my pharmacy job at, for the hospital, but now I had a job that was 8.30, uh, it was 8 to 4.30, and then I would teach 5 to nine or five to ten actually five to ten so that was a very long like days and that was like every single day like i had only the weekends off so eventually um i ended up um dropping down to like a contingent type of position there where i um filled in for them when they needed help so i i was primarily a pharmacy technician instructor there but i also filled in um, because of my educational background and stuff, I filled in for like the STNAs and the, um, um, so the, they also had a like medical coding and billing. I would fill in for them for like their physiology portions. So I would do that uh, for them as well when they needed the sub. So it was like, it was like a good way to make like good extra money, you know, and then I also got that teaching experience that I was kind of like looking for because you know, I feel like no matter what I want to do, like I want to end up at something that's tied academically to something. So teaching um, at Ross was a good way for me to, to gain experience with teaching with adult learners. Um, you know, I taught science-based courses and, you know, and then pharmacy technician skills. So, you know, it was a good way to get that teaching element that I needed. So I ended up dropping down. So then I ended up primarily working um, in the department of pediatrics, which was like, like I said, my whole kind of like open, like first look into like the clinical world and seeing kind of like how public health could be used, you know? So at this point, you know, I, I got to meet a lot of different people who were in public health. I got to meet a lot of physicians who also had, you know, my in public health backgrounds. And then, you know, I ended up, so my, my direct report is, was actually an infectious disease physician. So, you know, I feel like the pillar of ID is always to be, it's preventative. <laughs> you know, preventative care, preventative, uh, preventative care is like the pinnacle. Like, I, I feel like when it comes to our physicians, for at least what I can tell, I, infection disease doctors probably have the most exposure to public health principles. And they um, try to instill that in all they do because a lot of things can be avoided uh, which is preventative, you know, preventative measures. So, you know, I was able to sit in on like different, you know, grand rounds, different lectures, different events, like in my role as a coordinator for PEDS. And, you know, it really opened my eyes to the effects of um, public health. Um, you know, especially with, pedi with pediatrics, you know, everything about PEDS is preventative, you know, from, screening you know we do screening for newborns you know physicians do to to look out all the way from immunizations to participatory for participatory guidance which is you know all about preventative care um so like this population of of people was like an eye opener for me for public health so you know based on like wrapping up all my experiences from all my jobs and things together like this is the point where I realized that I needed to apply and get myself back on track in the schooling. And, you know, because, you know, I, I feel like you can only grow so much without having that educational um, title behind you. You know, so it's amazing how a couple of letters can really change the opportunities for you. So, you know, I had ended up applying. So I got that job and then I applied for uh, uh, MPH program at December last minute like you know i apply I've, I've been in contact with some of the staff 
Um, and, you know, they were able to like, kind of like push my stuff through. So that's when I ended up getting accepted into the um, graduate certificate program for um, epidemiology, because it was one of the programs that at that time you didn't need, uh, well, you don't need like to take the GRE to, to, to enroll in like post baccalaureate programs. So it was kind of like a nice uh, loophole that I, I advise some students who are interested in public health that sometimes some programs have that if you start off or do a, a graduate certificate program that you can matriculate right into an MPH program. So that was kind of like my route to continue on with education because I didn't have to wait. I, I didn't have to take a GRE which, you know, everyone knows that's a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, we spend our money on testing materials, um, study materials, study guides, study groups, and then you pay for that test. Like applying for the graduate certificate was a, an easier way for me to uh, do very well, you know, plus it was a good way for me to kind of like see, is this what I want to do? And a good way to kind of like get reacclimated to being a student again, because at this point I had not been a student in four years. So, you know, it was a good way for me to kind of like reassure myself um, and not have to wait and prolong with all the, you know, the process to get into a program. And, you know, by the time I had completed the requirements that I was needed for the graduate certificate, I was able to matriculate, you know, seamlessly right into my MPA program. So, which um, one benefit to that is, so it's a, kind of a little caveat uh, I want to point out because um, you know, graduate certificates are not usually covered by financial aid or scholarship money. So a lot of times people pursue these opportunities, they pay out of pocket for them um, or some kind of reimbursement. So one of the benefits is that while I was working in the department of pediatrics, they, it paid for my graduate certificate. So I, I pretty much like I avoided all costs um, that people would normally have to spend in order to receive something like this. So it was, it, you know, I feel like this was like, you know, like I couldn't have asked for any better way of things to be flowing, you know, for as far as like having a job, um, a job that's paying me decent money, a job that allowed me to pay for my schooling, a job that allowed me to, to cut costs and all these things that I would only have to pay for it if I wasn't um, an employee here and able to do it. So like, you know, that role, you know, and then I was getting real life experience. So like with a combination of all those things, like I feel like, you know, I was doing things like at the best time possible for me. Yeah, and, and you definitely leveraged every, every all the resources that were around you to, to get the best experience and and cut costs and, and those kinds of things while also getting, as, as you said, like you weren't sure like if this was for you, so you wanted to do the certificate first and, and get, mm -hmm. get your grasp and then go into your MPH. And that's really cool that you can just like seamlessly matriculate into the MPH program. Yeah, you so, know, I, go ahead. Oh, I, I was gonna say, yeah, like, I mean, it was a huge opportunity that, um, you know, I don't think a lot of people always take, you know, they have the opportunity here to be able to do things like that. Like I said, it's, it's a good way. Like I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to constantly learn. So, you know, the graduate certificate was a very um, good course like route for me to take that introduced me to public health, introduced me into epidemiology specifically because that was the area that I had an interest in um, and it didn't cost me anything. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So th did you continue into your MPH and do a concentration in epidemiology or are there any concentrations I should ask? Please? So yeah, so um, like you said, some universities don't have different concentrations, but um, University of Toledo does, like we have health promotion, education, we have epidemiology, we have environmental, occupational health, we have, uh, um, even new, we used to have nutrition and administration, but now we have a generalist concentration and then we have health policy. Okay. So um, what I did was I, like I said, I, I had gotten the graduate certificate in epidemiology. But then after that, you know, I talked to some of my mentors and some of the people that, you know, I looked up to. And so that's when, at that point, I had decided to switch and pursue a concentration of the health promotion and education. And my reasoning was, is because, like you said, there are a lot of schools that they don't really have concentrations. So most uh, public health students, you know, they have a general level of, of 
kind of like education or experience and all of the, you know, the main criteria that make up the MPH degree. So for me, I, I you know, I, I asked someone, you know, I asked quite a few people. I was like, so by me having a graduate certificate in FE, what benefit does that do for me to continue to have an MPH in the exact same thing? And because because I mean there are a lot of people who who have MPHs in something else or degrees something else, and then to show, you know, to show a certain level of knowledge, they just go back and get a graduate certificate to show that that's usually enough to show that you've had you know in depth knowledge or in depth research in a certain topic. So, well, well, would that be the same for me? And most people thought about it. I don't think they ever thought about that, and they were like, you know, what time that makes a lot of sense. So I would I chose to kind of like diversify my um, focus. So I did the graduate certificate in Epi, which you know I, I took you know extensive amounts of Epis, and I took Epi as um, additional um, electives for the MPH. So like you know I took reproductive, infectious, chronic, cancer, you know all of those types of areas of epidemiology. But then having the health promotion and education, I feel like aligned better with allowing me to uh, kind of like diversify myself. And then also because I had also, like I thought it would look well to have something with education in my, in my master's area, just because my, you know, up until now, I mean, my last like four or five years of work history has been in higher medical education. Mm -hmm. So having the health promotion and the education, I feel like branches me off into technically kind of like three different things. So I have a graduate certificate in epidemiology and my master's has a focus of health promotion and education. And so I feel like this is what made me the most versatile person um, as far as like what I could do in my future upon you know completion of my MPH degree. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's some great reasoning behind there. And def it definitely is a lot more versatile than you get in the graduate certificate in epi and then also epi concentration. Unless you wanted to become epidemiologist, then. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And then, you know, like having epidemiology, I mean, so we look at, at least at our curriculum, you know, there weren't too many more additional things that I need to do if I wanted to like get a, additional masters or something or have a different focus mm -hmm. in epi. But like, you know, having the graduate certificate on Epi is usually what all you would need for most jobs to like get a job like an Epi. Cause that's, I mean, to them that would show more than just the person who is just the MPH and a generalist, yeah. you know, or or MPH and like occupational help. Well, this person does have a graduate certificate in Epi. Plus I wanted to make myself more marketable because a lot of times these are two different roles, having someone who's in health promotion and have someone who's an Epi where I can do both. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's definitely something that I, I also advocate for, like doing, try not to do the same thing that you did in your undergraduate or what you already have familiar with, like branch off and lean more, more and just, just get yourself. Like, I, it's, it's funny. It's funny because I was just having a conversation today. I was reading this book called Range by uh, something Epstein. And he's just talking about how having like interest and knowledge of different spaces helps you be more effective in this one space because you're able to take knowledge from different for like like if, let's say someone is is doing biology they're siloed with that biology mind and someone coming in with a public health background might come in with something else that just sparks a different thought process and gets things done in a different way and and that has has become important and he say and in the book he's making the case that we've as a society pushed for a lot of um like specialities but a generalist is, mm -hmm. is is what is going to thrive in in the world that we are continuing to live in these days it is and you know i i feel like um like even in like medicine and things like that and public health you know in public health you know you have like a at the like a public health department you have someone who's focusing on the data and, and epi you have someone that's focusing on the marketing you have someone that's focusing on like the community engagements but you know the same thing happens like even in my, like in my day-to-day -day when I work with different physicians and different stuff, you know, like for me, I work in public, um, I mean, I work in student affairs and like, you know, all of my counterparts and my boss, they, like they all have um, masters of education. So like, I usually view things from a, a different perspective being that I have a master's in public health. So when we talk about certain issues or certain things, like they are, you know, like if it's data-driven because of my epi background, they'd be like, oh, well, Tyrone would probably doesn't mind doing that or like you know when I when I first actually got into the role they asked me to design like a um 
uh, a wellness pathway for the student affairs because you know student affairs is actually a very big department that kind of like encompasses this, encompasses like a large area of students and wellness usually falls in that so like in our department um you know we have a wellness group we have a wellness coordinator um but like it's something that a lot of people who go into student affairs, they're, they're usually just education driven and don't really have that background when it comes to dealing with wellness or dealing with, um, you know, public health issues. So, you know, making sure that you branch off into those different spaces, like you said, it's something that, you know, it's definitely needed in education. And that's why I think it's good when you have those big like curriculum, those big task force that it comes from a variety of people from different backgrounds which I feel like has not been more evident in higher education than um, dealing with the result of COVID. You know, you needed those people in public health backgrounds to be in those higher up positions across, you know, campuses. Yeah, absolutely, that is so true. Um, yeah. Are there any other takeaways that you wanted to share from your MPH program? Um, I just think, you know, my, my so my, I don't know if all, probably not all NPH programs, but like our NPH program is supposed to be designed for like the working professional. Generally people usually enter our universe, enter the program with like two years of public health experience, but obviously it's not always the case, but like, you know, that usually encompasses us, you know, usually having like weekends or um, evening courses, which I find to be very beneficial for me because I was someone who worked, you know, at 8.30 to 5.00 you know, um, day. So, you know, driving to, driving straight from work to course was, you know, plausible for me because, um, you know, they had evening courses. And I remember like my first semester in like grad school, you know, like I had biostats and epi every other Saturday from eight to four. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was not like, you know, the most desirable schedule, but it was something that worked for someone who was trying to, you know, continue with education and, and still maintain a job where I know not everyone has that, you know, some programs are like cohort driven and you must be a full time or, you know, the courses are usually during the day where um, that wasn't the case. So, you know, that was something that I, I like to give shout out to, you know, my MPH program. Um, and then for anyone else who's looking for an MPH program, make sure that that's something um, how your school is set up if you're someone who has to work. Yeah, def definitely think about that, that flexibility. That is so true. And then after mm -hmm. you graduated, you became a grant writer uh, slash undergraduate supervisor at the Kidney Foundation of Northwest Ohio. So how did you come across this yes. role? So I came across this role um, actually by the chair person um, of my MPH program. Um, you know, I told him, you know, like I, I needed something to give me like I, I needed more experience you know you graduate you don't have experience you don't have any kind of um you know kind of like real life experience in doing those types of things so you know he had you know called another faculty member who he knew had a project um he actually is a um, hire consultant for the Northwest, um, the Kinney Foundation of Northwest Ohio. So he does a lot of their like public health initiatives and work like that. And he was looking for, you know, students. He usually takes students and stuff all the time. So uh, I think he usually takes undergraduate students. So, you know, me being, you know, an MPH person, you know, he gave me the role of being able to actually um, oversee the undergraduate students. You know, I, I was someone that he already knew had like experience as far as like being a professional, which a lot of times, like I said, I think a lot of the like internships or externships you do, they spend a lot of focus on that because that's usually what you, what a person lacks. But someone like me who's been working, you know, like higher medical education, you know, I, he was able pretty much to tell me what he want, what, what my job and role was, and I was able to produce. So I find it to be a very um, rewarding and very great experience for me because um, it allowed me to, like all of the undergraduate students reported to me. So they, they were all working on various different public health um, tasks. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time working with each of them individually from, you know, like professional careers. So, you know, like I helped them with their CVs, I helped them with their personal statements, all the way to whatever projects that we were working on, whether that was, you know, talking about like, medical adherence or talking about, you know, the 
effects of COVID on kidneys. Like, you know, it, it, it allowed me to learn how to mentor and teach again. You know, like I said, that's like my pharmacy technician skill teaching experience come into play. But it, uh, while also making me be um, kind of like just the first line of, of like just the first line, because everything they turn in, they turn to me, I will approve it or not, I give them feedback. And then for me, it went to the, actually the PhD student, the PhD student will approve and look over it and then it will go to um, my um, mentor, my advisor, who was Dr. Jordan. So like he, he has this tier level approach, which I actually um, really enjoy and something I'll probably use in the future. Um, for when you're kind of like, you know, you're the mentee and you're the mentor, you're in between. Um, both of those phases, but you know, it, it was up to me. So you know, I, I made it up my personal initial, my personal goal to make sure that whatever topic they were writing about, I knew it in and out. You know, I would ask them questions, kind of make them forced to, you know, because like I said, they're they're new, they're they're all seniors, you know, doing like their field experience, and you know, I'm like, you know, you're writing an article on diversity, and I'm like, you know, you've only mentioned diversity in regards to like black people. I'm like, you have to understand that, that I'm pretty sure that when he gave you this article, diversity is supposed to be for people of all races and people who have disabilities and people, you know, like everything that made people diverse. And like, that was something that, you know, my student just didn't think about, you know, it wasn't that they didn't, wasn't going to do it or, or, you know, felt some kind of way. It's just that they, I'm trying to help them to open their minds. So, you know, this was a very good experience for me because I also had people who were like, I mean, I had a student who was from Ghana had a student who was from Saudi Arabia. So I had to deal with a lot of different cultural differences. And to me, it was just, it was a, it was a very good internship experience that allowed me to be able to prepare myself for like leadership roles, because this is what you have if you were working in the health department or if you were working for the CDC. You have people who will come from different, you know, different places, different backgrounds. And, you know, I wanted to be able to, you know, work with them uh, and without, making them feel offended or scared you know like I, I had one student that was very timid you know her culture you know women are very submissive to men and you know she um and English was like her third language second or third language so she had issues with that so I was able to like help her you know help her encourage her which is something that you know I can't guarantee that you will get at a company where they feel like well we're paying you to do a job and you're having you're doing you know, poor with communication. And like, you know, she was a wonderful student. She did great, great work. She um, just had a little bit of confidence issues and, you know, and, and there was a cult little cultural differences there. So, you know, like that experience um, of being a supervisor was great. But then I also, so like the main goal is um, the Kennedy Foundation of North, of North Ohio was up for their grant renewal. So, you know, this gave me, um, experience with on what goes into a grant, you know, like, you know, this grant write up or because they already had the grant. So this is one of those situations where they have to submit data and information to kind of like get the grant renewed. So, you know, this is like us turning like a hundred page document of all the things that we have been doing for the last like nine months and data. And so it was, a, like I was able to contribute in that directly you know like you know i directly overseen all of the patient um education resources for the website as well as coming up with some surveys and things for to um for the um, renal professionals patients and things like the case work the social workers and the healthcare administrators and nurses who work in um at like Dallas, the centers here in the, in this region. So, you know, it was really good public health experience and grant writing experience. You know, we were able to review and see like the document and add our notes and stuff. And, you know, it was just a very good experience for me because, you know, I feel like grant writing is one of those types of skills that is needed, whether you're in public health or whether you're in hardcore science, like chemistry or bio, or um, even in business, you know, I have a good friend who, you know, they need to write business grants. So like grant writing was a skill that um, I had some experience with it in our MPH program. Our, our MPH program does make sure that you have exposure to that because a lot of PhD programs, that's like a requirement that you'd be able to write grants. So like, I just looked at this as like, this was the perfect opportunity for me to get these more experience in something that is 
essential probably for my growth. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's like a side job, you know, hiring a grant writer, you know, so like I just looked at it as, as another like blessing in disguise and, you know, something that meant more to me than what even I probably would have thought of, you know, if you would have said Tyrone, pick somewhere to go and what you want to do, like I probably would not have thought to pick this place in kidneys mm -hmm. and also, you know, pick a grant writer role. And I, I think to, to that point, you, uh, well, I guess just put yourself out there because you never know. And you you were able to also like get the experience of working with students, working with people, and also like working like up and down at the same the same time and really balancing that. And and I think that that's important to a skill, important skill to get. And it's it's kind of hard to get that skill uh, yeah. management and, and, and stuff around that. So that, that is awesome. Yeah, and you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it, it, like, I mean, you had to, I had to balance work and stuff with this. So a lot of times I met, I met with the students uh, on the weekend. So like my Saturday, sometimes from 12 to four, I, I'm literally back to back one hour sessions or mm -hmm. sometimes throughout the week, you know, I, I didn't work, you know, a full, uh, you know, day. And now I have meetings scheduled from like six to eight with students. So like, you know, it's something that, that if you, if you are really committed to wanting to improve or, or learn to do more, you do it, you do what you have to do. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so after this role, you mm -hmm. uh, you got into your current role as an assistant director of student affairs at the University of Toledo. So how, how do you uh, come across this and get into this role? So, um, like I tell everyone, um, I probably have said it like already like 10 times, but there, it's, it's really a, a benefit for working for like an academic institution and especially like an academic institution that's tied to like a hospital because then you have opportunities at both places and also at a main campus. So like for us, a lot of things are divided between like a main campus, a health science campus, which is usually like the colleges, the academic side, but then the hospital. So I moved from um, Pete's, I, you know, the clerkship coordinator in Pete's, which was actually located at a different offsite like another hospital that the pediatric department is um, kind of like partner with back to the health science campus where the university's hospital and all the other colleges are at. So, I mean, it's just like anything, you know, I, I would look at the job board and, you know, I found this opportunity um, that they were looking, you know, someone for this. And, you know, I already had um, kind of experiences and kind of like with, with that team over there. Um, also, my primary um, direct report, my mentor, uh, who I had in Peds, had also had another appointment, a faculty appointment um, as student affairs as well. So, you know, I just kind of like would talk to her about student affairs, like, you know, how, how do you like it over there? You know, what is it that you do? And, you know, she had that role for almost about, I think, two years or so before I even applied and, you know, um, I ended up applying for that position because because of our size. Uh, University of Toledo actually has a, a pretty big medical school. We graduate about 170, um, 165, 170 medical students every class, which is kind of a large size for a medical school. So like they were looking for an an additional assistant director. So I'm, it's one I'm one of two, which I thought were like well that'd be great because it's not like I'm not filling in for taking over someone. I, I'm going to be able to start a position where, you know, I'll probably be able to be trained and I'll be able to someone who can probably cover me when I'm on vacation. Like, it sounds like it's like a great opportunity. So, you know, I, I, and like I said, I had already kind of had some experiences with the team over there. Like, they all seem very pleasant and, you know, I thought it would be nice. And, you know, I got called for an interview, which I was a little hesitant about because, um, you know, it was something like my my mentor or the person who was in that role, my, my, my direct report, she had just like fully transitioned out of my department. And, you know, I'm thinking like, what are they gonna think like, oh my God, like, well, she left her department and now Tyrone's going to the department. You know, I didn't want that kind of like friction to look, but, you know, I was very, you know, excited to know, you know, like she wasn't like involved in the process at all. Like, you know, she didn't recommend me or anything. She didn't even know that I applied, you know, cause I mean, she was actually like, 
out of the country, in like India. You know, like I told her, I, I, you know, I didn't tell her that I was interviewing, but I got an interview and you know, they offered me a job. So like I emailed, emailed her a letter stating that, you know, that I was going to, you know, um, put in like a two week notice saying that I was going to study in affairs and, you know, she was, you know, wish me best of luck, but like, you know, she, she was not involved in that, which I felt very, a lot better about my transition. Cause I didn't want, you know, I, I try not to burn bridges and I didn't want to make it look bad either. Like, okay, well, you know, your boss is going to a department and now you're going to department, but like, it was totally like, just more or less a coincidence mm -hmm. kind of, you know? So, you know, I got that role um, at the, what, literally, like a week or two weeks after the stay at home order went into play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was a little concerned, like, are they going to ask me to kind of like, you know, stay a little longer, or, you know, and, you know, my new department uh, was like, no, like, we, we want you now, you know, like, we have a lot of things that's going on, you know, COVID's affecting us too. So we think you'd be a good addition to come like right now. So, you know, I had transitioned, um, out of that role um and mind you like i said it's just a little bit nervous i had a lot going on you know like i said i had, I had all these deaths happening with my family and you know i was in my last semester of grad school and and then i started a new role so you know it was definitely something that had had me a little anxious at the time and you know um and that's like where i am right now <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so t tell me, what what do you do, and how how is that work split up between you and the other assistant director? Um. So, what I do now. So, there are a couple of things that we kind of like share or like we assist each other in. Um. Like for example, like my counterpart primarily handles like commencement orientation. Um like in like match day for like medical students. And I kind of like assist in those um, manners and you know, any way that we have to do. Whereas like I, specific, I specifically oversee um, things like the grad award ceremony. I oversee all of the student organizations that are part of the College of Medicine. So there's about 66 different organizations that I oversee. I oversee all of their budgets um, and all of their like planning. Um, I also am a part of a few different um, committees that I um, kind of like have been either asked to because of my expertise in public health or either because I think will be a good addition. So like, like I'm part of the general review committee that I do, which um, I found that was a, kind of like a, a recent thing. Um, so as you know, all universities, well, I won't say all universities, but I'm, I'm pretty sure all universities they have a general fee charge on your account. And you probably don't know like where the heck does that go? Well, it goes to various few, like various things across all the campuses of the university. So like I was part of the review committee this year to actually go over each of, um, of the, or each of the departments that receive general fee funds. So like I, you know, I heard them out that they talk about whether they need more or less or the same. And because of COVID, you know, we've had to make changes. So, you know, we give them recommendations and things like that. So that's been um, a pretty good experience. Um, I'm also a part of the LGBTQIA committee for the health science campus. So I represent um, the health science campus and issues and manners related to the LGBT community, um, which is you know, public health as well. Um, I'm also um, recently, I've been actually part of the president of the university's um, task force for elimination of systemic racism on both campuses. So it's a mixture of me doing a lot of day-to-day -day things, but also um, kind of like committees and things that you don't usually, like those type of opportunities weren't really presented to me as a coordinator, but being like assistant director, director level, you started to be able to um, partake in some of these committees like that. So typically um, I, I also oversee all summer um, opportunities which includes like some some clinical like peds and family medicine but also like the community health projects where we have medical students that are um all throughout the city they're they're working with different community health um departments or organizations to do different work so i oversee that as well as the medical student um research uh 
um, program as well, where medical students get to do different um, research projects with different faculty um, at the campus. So I, I oversee all that, all of those different things, and not to mention just all the little bitty fires and stuff that comes out. Like I said, student affairs is kind of a, a big organ, like a big umbrella term. Like we, we, like I said, we handle like student wellness. We also handle like uh, disciplinary um, scholarships. Um, so like all, all of that makes up the umbrella of the department that I work for. It's just that I specifically work for the College of Medicine. Where it's like there's someone else who does this for the rest of the university. Okay, yeah, that, that's a lot of diverse things that you're doing there, and that, that's great to hear. T tell me, look, looking back or just like reflecting on this position, how mm -hmm. did did you ever foresee yourself in this this type of position, like going throughout your career, or? Um, yes and no. So, the reason why I, I took this position. Um, was primarily for one, okay, one is for advancement for like a title, you know, um, assist, a coordinator title is, you know, less than an assistant director or director title. So it looks good on like when we're talking about growth because mm -hmm. usually an assistant director, that title is usually indicative for certain manners. Like, you know, you have experience with like managing a team or having, you know, people report to you or, you know, handling budget. So like that was one thing that I did not have experience with um, exactly before this position that I wanted to take this position because I wanted the opportunity to gain that, which was budget experience, you know? So I, I deal with budgets um, that have like over $100,000, $300,000 accounts, you know, all together, you know, probably maybe close to a million dollars, which has allowed me to be able to um, be able to learn like that financial piece that I had not gotten necessarily in my other roles because you know I look at all my positions as being a way to to add something value to me and being you know like an administrator or being or a professor or someone of a you know different higher standard because to me that was the last piece of the experience that I lacked um kind of like previous or some kind of proof that I had experience in dealing with you know like I, now I've had experience with teaching i've had experience with people reporting to me supervisory i've had experience with research education so like budget was like one of the last few things that i usually see in jobs of like administration level that i did not have so to me this was the last piece of the puzzle that i needed in order to you know apply for thing, for different jobs like just i mean like even like a like a health commissioner you know like you know, having a public health and background is important, but then they want you to have all these other additional skills that isn't necessarily indicative of what you went through um, in your different positions or through your schooling. You know, yes, you may have a doctor of health, but like, they're not gonna hire you if you don't have any kind of skills with handling a budget or handling any kind of skills with supervising or dealing with difficult um, difficult uh, employees. So like, this was like something that, this was an opportunity that I could get from a role that I had not had already. Yeah, that's great that, that you're looking to continue to develop skills that you haven't had and, and really just building out yourself as a as a as a all round practitioner and, and being able to plug into a bunch of different uh, or plug into different roles in different ways is awesome. Yeah, yeah because the and and then my other previous role as a coordinator, um, you know, it was a it was a pretty granular route. You know, like I dealt specifically with PEDS. So like I dealt with all medical students that were like specifically in their pediatric rotation. But being at assistant director, you know, I'm not specific to any specific like department. So I get to see everything from a full perspective. Like I, I you know, I'm more involved with. Well, I'm, I'm more involved now with all of this, the medical years, whereas before I was just primarily involved with like the third, fourth year. But you know, being this kind of like overall like arch umbrella you know like it's allowed me to be able to actually do a lot more like public health types of things at a more kind of like broad scale that I could not do um as a coordinator yeah that makes sense so uh before we move on to the last section of the show where would you like to see yourself in the future so um in the future I'll more than likely like to see myself, you know, um, obtaining some kind of doctoral level degree, um, whether it's a PhD or, 
DRPH or maybe even an MD, I'm, you know, who knows. Um, but whatever I um, choose to pursue, you know, I would prefer to um, be working in like an academic setting or, or something that's related to an academic setting, whether it's like an academic hospital. Um, and I also like to, I like to do research type of things in public health. So um, I would prefer to stay here in Toledo. You know, I'm, I'm born and raised here. You know, I'm an advocate for Toledo. I try to support Toledo, Ohio as much as I possibly can. But, you know, if the opportunity, you know, is not there, you know, I would be looking possibly to move somewhere else. But hopefully I can say I can see myself here with, with my family, um, you know, doing great things in the city of Toledo. Yeah, awesome. And I, I look forward to seeing uh, what, what comes next and how your career does develop. <laughs> so moving on to the Furious Five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, mm -hmm. what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Um, so one, like I tell everyone, I would say uh, focus on networking. Um, that would get you far in public health. That would get you far in any area that you work in. You know, um, one of the benefits of, of my MPH program that I didn't necessarily see then that I kind of see now is that, you know, my, our MPH program was very big on um, collaborative and group projects. I'm thinking like, man, like why, why, you know? <laughs> I, well, you know, I found it to be a little bit more difficult for me being that, you know, even though I'm only 30, you know, now and then I was 20, you know, eight, nine, that, there is a really big difference in a 29 year old and like the 23 year old who's, mm -hmm. you know, who's matriculated right from undergrad into the grad school program. You know, I found it like I was almost like a difficult person because, you know, I was the person that like I'm only available after five and, you know, I'm trying to get like a Saturday and they're like, well, can we go on like Tuesday morning at 11? I'm like, I'm working. You know, I, I you know, it was very difficult some in some instances and you know I think I probably you know made a few um, of my students uh, my colleagues a little upset that I kind of like a not an open not as an as open availability as they did but um, you know it was something that you know when you graduate you realize the importance of networking and having connections and you know, I, I still talk to, you know, a few of my fellow MPH people who are, you know, they're all over the place in Cincinnati, you know, U of M, you know, one just went back to Nepal, like, you know, I still try to keep in contact with them. And, you know, I look at it as those being possible, you know, contacts and references for me if I need it or, or at their institutions or where they work. Um, another one would be, um, I guess, another advice would be, um, don't be afraid to work in an area of interest that um, you don't think you'll be interested in. You know, I, like I said, I always had an interest in medicine and things like that. And I had never thought that I would have such beneficial um, opportunities working in pediatrics and in nephrology. You know, like those are two things that would have never ranked high and even my remotely in the areas of interest uh, like I would have thought, like at least clinically, but they have been some of the most public health rewarding opportunities that I have had, you know. Um, so like, don't don't think something that's not like you're not going to be interested. Like, don't knock it before you try it. That that's that's the good way to sum that up. Don't knock it before you try it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is like, think outside of the box. Um, for example, you know, a lot of people when you graduate from public health. You look for those typical, you know, standard jobs, epidemiologist, health educator, sanita sanitarian. But, um, you know, I feel like that's where you really need to think about what it is about public health that you really enjoy. Because, like, for me, I enjoyed like, actually learning and doing different things in public health and helping the public. But, like, I realized that I can do that in a different manner without necessarily working in a health department or working for the CDC or, you know, working for necessarily like a hospital as an educator, like you can, you can use those skills in various um, different platforms and environments. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's up to you to make it when you make it, you know, and student affairs, my counterpart, um, you know, public health is not necessarily her thing. So she's not involved in all the same things that I do or, or, or 
the same committees that I do, but I found those to be, you know, most beneficial and rewarding for me and of my interest because of the, the fact that mostly all of them are public health driven, you know, LGBTQIA community, you know, they have several public health issues and, you know, it isn't any different on a campus or the systemic racism on campuses that is a public health crisis, you know, like, so these are issues that involve, you know, my skill set, my experiences, and, you know, it allows me to be able to share and make a difference. And, you know, like, you know, we talk about public health as being, you know, for the population. And, you know, one thing that people don't understand is that population is like a big term, but, you know, we have different populations. Like the Black community is a population. The elderly is a population. Medical students is a, is a separate population of people that are, you know, they're at high risk of suicide, high, high risk of depression. And, you know, so I've, I've been able to kind of like, I guess you can say like, kind of like find my niche in my area without necessarily being coded as a public health worker. Yeah. And, and then my other advice will just be, uh, be intentional in everything that you do. You know, from the moment that I feel like I was a farm tech to the moment that why I'm now this director, like I don't, I don't hold my, even though assistant director may have a higher value when it comes to like title wise, I don't personally, I don't hold it to be any more valuable than my pharmacy technician job that I had when I was 23. You know, like the experiences that I learned from each one have been, you know, paramount in my ability to provide care and expertise on various issues. Like I tell people, like I just put an article out about medical adherence. And, you know, I feel like as a public health person, you you don't really know that experience because that's not what you were taught. It's not what you would experience. But my experience as a pharmacy technician was able to help me collaborate well with what I know as a public health person and like the, the steps that are needed in order to, to write a very well thought out article about medical, about medication adherence, you know? So like, I was able to combine two different areas, two different past fields and combine it with the public health and come up with something that I think would be very useful to um, providers and to patients. Um, so be intentional in what all that you do and, you know, whether it's enjoying what you do or, or it's benefiting you, you know, whether it's financially or both, you know, make it be worthwhile and not something don't spread yourself then yeah some great advice right there uh number two if you're talking to mm -hmm. someone wanting to get into your position what advice would you give them um probably three things um uh, one would be is don't be afraid to start at the bottom you know i feel like a lot of students whether you get a bachelor's or a master's you know you think you're about to get like this train like you think you're gonna just graduate and be a health commissioner like right out the back and it's like you know, you have to climb, you know, was it climb before you walk, crawl before you walk, that's the word, you have to crawl, you have to crawl before you walk, and like, I feel like a lot of people think it's beneath them, but I tell people, you know, it's, it was worth it, like, if, if I started out as a director, I don't think I would have been prepared for my role, if I just graduated and they gave me a assistant director role, and it was, you know, and I, I found, like I said, some of my best people growing up, like my best support, my best mentorship have been the secretaries. You know, it's been, you know, the administrative assistants. And even now, you know, you, you will realize that when you get in higher positions, you know, it isn't always, you know, about knowing that person. It's about knowing their administrative assistant. It's about knowing a secretary. She's the one who's going to get you in. And that meeting that you've been trying to get in, you know, like, you know, so those connections, um, are you know really worthwhile and you get that from starting at the bottom so don't be afraid um two you have to be um a self learner and you have to take initiative i feel like all my positions that i've had from even being a farm tech if i wasn't a self learner or take initiative on my own to learn and buy and invest in myself and things like that i would have not have gotten the opportunities that i that i have gotten um, you know, like I said, I had to learn everything that I needed to learn when I got that research position. I didn't know anything about all those types of chemistries and all these different types of scientific instruments, but I took time, like I was reading, I was learning, I was asking questions. You know, when I became a pharmacy tech, I had no information about drugs. Like I, I, I bought self books, I bought flashcards, I, you know, watched YouTube, like, so I took that initiative. So, 
um, you would have to do that too, more than likely on any job that you're not just given or, you know, have some kind of, you know, um, like leeway, you know, someone that can help pull you there. And then the third thing is um, don't underestimate yourself, but like, don't, but don't be overconfident either. So, you know, it's, it's good to um, know your capabilities. Like, you know, it's, it, it isn't nothing wrong with saying, there isn't, anything, there isn't anything wrong with saying you don't know or you don't understand or I'm gonna have to get back with you instead of always coming off as like a know-it-all or someone that no one can tell you what to do. You know, if you don't know it, like just be quiet. That's what I tell myself. If I don't know something, I'll be quiet. But the moment I know something, I will talk, I'll speak. And if I don't know something, I'm very good at going back and reading about it or finding out. So like you, you usually won't catch me twice not knowing about something. That's a very like that, to me that that those are the things that have allowed me to get to where I am. Awesome. Uh, number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? Uh <clears throat> well, professionally, so I am working this to I'm studying for the chess exam. Um, for those of you who don't know, you know, the certified health exam is only offered twice a year. So, you know, I'm looking forward to studying that and um, hopefully taking that in October. Um, <clears throat> I'm also trying to be more involved in like my, my community. Like I do a lot like for the university, which is the community as well. But like, you know, I want to expand that to like my more local community, you know, my church family. Um, you know, and have a little bit more presence and maybe some kind of organization that does more things for the local community. Um, and then I just, and then for myself, I've been working on just trying to have a more impact in public health. So like I said, I've, I've started, you know, um, writing more articles and things like that for, for LinkedIn, you know, sharing more things like on my Facebook page and Twitter and things of that sort. Like I said, I've been trying to have a more presence of bringing public health and making it aware. Cause I, you know, in public health, you know, the biggest thing is education and awareness for most things. So I've, I've been trying to have a, play a more active role in that and, and stay sharp on public health topics. Okay, that's great. Um, number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Um, so professionally, um, when it comes to like, like books and things like that. So um, I feel like I, it varies on what your interest is. Like I can recommend a few different things that I read or a few things that I do, but obviously I understand that that's not for everyone. Um, like for example, like I, like I said, I'm, I'm real big on like with race and kind of social determinants of health. So like, you know, um, I'm finishing up the Just Medicine, which is a cure for racial inequality in American healthcare by um, Dana Bowen. Um, and before that, I had read, you know, the one that I feel like has been circulating a lot on um, like public health circles is the medical apartheid, the dark history, uh, medical experimentation um, by Harriet Washington. But one other book that I have kind of like recommended people to, especially like people who are interested in epidemiology, is to buy the CDC Field Epidemiology Manual book. Now, it's for those who, if you go to like the CDC and you do like the the epidemiology like internships that they offer they kind of like go through this book but for people like me who continuously working and stuff like that I don't, I don't have the opportunity or the luxury to just you know not work for I think it's like I think it's a year I'm not 100% sure maybe six months six months and go to Atlanta and then go through it so I bought the book to kind of like study and read on my own you know it's it's kind of a dense book um it's something that um it's definitely not for everyone, <laughs> but I found it to be a very good resource. And even if you don't read it, it's something that you should have something for a good reference if you do any kind of epidemiology work. And then the other thing that I recommend you do, so like obviously those are all like public health driven books. I recommend that you read something that's not public health for your own just work-life balance. 
So actually I'm reading, I'm a big fantasy kind of like book kind of like reader guy. So I'm actually reading this book called Loki, uh, Where Mischief Lies by Mackenzie Lee. So that's where I'm reading leisurely. <laughs> okay, uh, that's great. And yeah, I think it's definitely important to, to branch off from, from just public health stuff sometimes, uh, especially with books. I feel like they're just really, they can be very demoralizing. Uh, just reading a lot of them constantly uh, with no real yeah. change. Society, especially so. yeah especially if you read like kind of depressing but like if you read so many racial you know discriminative books you kind of like like oh my god like you feel yourself becoming a little bit kind of a pessimistic so mm -hmm. you know you read something a little bit more lighthearted. Yeah, absolutely absolutely so last but not least where can people mm -hmm. connect with you um, so I recommend people to primarily connect with me through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is kind of like the platform that I feel fits best. Um, it's the way where I usually publish like the different articles and where I usually engage with other, um, you know, public health or anyone else that's interested in whether it's public health or like uh, student affairs or in higher education. Okay, great. Well, everyone definitely make sure to connect with Tyrone on LinkedIn. Um, I look out for, for more of your, your articles and stuff. But thank you so much for taking time to be on the show tonight and sharing your story and your insights and everything like that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. Um, make sure to subscribe on YouTube or any podcast platform that you're listening to. Leave a like if you're on YouTube and then uh, definitely share this with a friend. I appreciate you all.